A very welcome, everybody. Congratulations on making it to this part. As uh, you already know, this time you wanted it to be a little bit more smaller group, select group. We're going to look at, over the next 12 weeks, we're going to look at three topics. We're going to look at product vision, product positioning, and systems thinking. What we're going to do is we're going to play a game, all right? Uh, there's paper, sketches, whatever. Over the course of the next 10 minutes, I want you to make the best paper play. Right? Go for it. One. Make individual exercise. Okay, whenever you ask a question, why are we doing this? I want you guys to remember something that I learned in Stanford Teeth, which is trust the process. A few moments later. You keep it. <laughs> you can test it. Do whatever you want. Be ready. You have five more minutes. <laughs> Go and see what everybody is making. What is she? Yeah. If my plane is not to be proper, can I make a boat? No, we are only second to plane. Good question. Okay. Yeah. Best paper plane. The way it is. Okay, come. Sit, sit, sit. Quickly, sit. Sit, 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 sit. I forgot how much of a teacher I am in one of these things. Okay, who believes they have the best type of life? Who wants to come and showcase your best type of life? No, come here and tell the whole story behind your paper plane. Three people. Whoever wants to come next, be ready. 30 seconds. Uh, I don't know how to build paper plane, so this is the first effort I spent 10 minutes of my time to build this and then my favorite color, grey, my favorite color actually. Also like, with this crowd, <laughs> I feel this is the best one. Okay. You want to go next? Angle Mr. Vinaya. You're already on camera. Angli, are we tripping this? See, this is the first fastest paper plane, uh, which is like <laughs> fastest paper plane, uh, which is um, which is basically meant only for India. So that is why I have made one of the colors of the flag, like for India. And also, you can see like uh, this is the best plane. Which whenever you see that, you will feel like, oh, this is the best plane. And if you guys want to go into it, you have to try it once. And I have named it as FFP2. And this is my second version. First version is fake. <laughs> uh, so basically, this is first fastest paper plane of second version. And uh, maybe she will raise come in and uh, get, it, get it on board. Who wants to go next? Last? <laughs> Don't worry, please. Yes. Okay, you can also go. Go on. So, uh, this is my first version. And it is successful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, no, you don't have to answer the question. That's yeah, it. That's a fight behind the word. This is a fight of plane. See? No, no. Fight? See the friend. Hey! <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> Alright, thank you. Nazir, go for it. Last one. Uh, nah, you get for the 
10th anniversary we are, are going to go out of India, right? 20th anniversary. Yeah, yeah, something. Uh, this is the plane we are going to go in. And it says, uh, see, I'm, I don't know what to name it. I just like. Yeah, my rest. Perfect. All right. Thank you very much. So, many of the times the products that we build and the story that our founders tell are very similar to the story that you said, right? I, this is the thing I wanted to build it, so I built it and it is the best, right? I built it with the vision of uh, um, India's, India's whatever, I'm inspired by India, this thing. You had a vision of uh, Siam and we will do that, right? And that's how we started and then you said something that this was my first attempt. And I built it and that's what inspires me, right? So over the course of next three weeks, the reason um, we did this whole exercise was that a vision exercise is a bit of imagination brought back down with some amount of science, right? With that, I found a great quote that I wanted to share. You cannot depend on your eyes when your imagination is out of focus. So over the course of next three weeks, what I'd like for you guys is to work a little with imagination and think big, think large in terms of what the whole vision of your product that you're going to be working on is going to be. A lot of you guys started saying this was my first thing, that was your vision. But nobody also, some of you, some veterans asked, what does best mean? Who is this best for? Is this best for a five-year-old? Is this best for CEO of Siam Computing? You had your own theories, right? So what does best mean and how? what is your imagination towards making the best happen? Little bit of a cheese ball over there. But um, wanted to set the context of what we're going to be doing over the next three weeks. All right. Why do products fail? And that's why I said your best guess. Yeah. Lack of enthusiasm. Lack of enthusiasm. From whom? From if it's my product, from me. Okay. If the product does not solve the user's problem. Okay. Getting the product, uh, the best rated product to a wrong market. Best what? Like you could have the best form in the world. But, but you're selling it to the wrong people. To wrong people. Got it. Also some products. They do well, they attract uh, users, but they don't convert that into uh, customers. Why? Well, it's not because, user uh, friendly. It's not user friendly. Or the pricing is high. Okay. What else? Getting These are all surface level, but from a product, go ahead. Getting demotivated uh, when they fix the initial things. Yeah. Like the reaching a customer are open. Got it. But, I mean, these are good ideas. Go a little deeper. You have worked with so many founders and you've seen how they go about building the product. Because they don't have a very clear go-to-market strategy. They don't have a go-to-market strategy. Early stage founders, that's the problem. Then? It is not accessible to everyone. Not everybody can... When you say accessible, what does it mean? For example, if you consider like by use, they can like reach the product with a single tab actually. Yeah. It can reach to even like tight three cities. Yeah. So that is a point of accessibility. Yeah. But if you consider some other products like consider it is like a like online product. Yeah. It can be reached to even tight two cities. Got it. So that is why it wouldn't be like scalable and that is the point why it failed actually. Got it. So let's take that, right? And why do product teams not think through this and get to the surface level problems that you said, right? Uh, it's not accessible, it's there's no go to market strategy. Um, it's not user friendly, right? All of these are surface layer problems. But what are the root causes? Let's say that so many companies that have great uh, product teams, on, I wouldn't say great, out, they have a big product team, but still don't figure out how to build a good product. Lack of clarity. Lose sight of the end user. Lose sight of the end user. Clarity, planning. One thing what I've gone through is they don't know where to sell it. Whatever product you take, they don't know what to do because they keep saying 
that I will build the best UI, best thing. Yeah. But they, are, they have a feeling that they want to keep building it. They want to keep building it, building it, building it. What is best for the product is not best for the user. So basically, the market research, uh, the pre-work for building a product uh, is not sufficient to build a product. So they have not understood. They have insight on what I am doing right now. Got it. What else? So we, we are tr trying to dive deep, right? Like why do product teams fail? And why are they not able to do these basic things, which is surface level things, right? Why understand the user, build a friendly product, build it for a go-to-market. What is going on? So some of the things we understood, right? There's no roadmap. They're disconnected from user's need. You mentioned that they love building products continuously. Anything else? They don't have a clear use. No, no. Again, so why? That's the question, right? Like you're telling your surface level stuff. Why do, why do they not? They don't, uh, nothing about it from crunch, right? He believes that he has a USP. You don't think they have a USP. My, I'm trying to shift your focus. Be part of the exist, their team. Okay. And why do they fail? They don't evolve as per the evolving needs of users. Okay. Their ideas, uh, the ideas or the uh, about the product is not validated. They don't know how to validate the ideas which I, which they have initially. Got it. Yeah, they are all yeah, fixed on a solution. The solution rather than the problem itself. Fixed on solution rather than problem, which is what Chid was saying. Right. So, um, this is something I picked up from the book that I'm reading and I thought I'd show it to you guys. 10 reasons why I thought uh, products fail and we can go through them very clearly. Um, focus on outputs versus outcomes, which is, I want to keep building, 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 building. Do you know any client, any, doesn't have to be a client, do you know, since you're going to be doing this, any company that does this, according to you, lot of features, lot of features being churned out, but not really useful. Theorem. Theorem. Theorem? What, what do they do? The US based and uh, uh, I mean they were actually like building like you can like take a blood sample and you can get all the results in just 18 seconds. Yeah. They were building this for the last 6 years but she couldn't able to like bring out the product and she's taken it. Got it, yeah. That's a good example which is that they are continuously in build mode never in output mode and nothing really comes out. Um, for me, a lot of the, uh, um, when I look at a lot of, like even Jarmin when I use it, there are so many features it's got, right? But the two features that I really want work very okay. But they have churning out new features by the dozen. Uh, counting house, obsession with internal metrics, right? They are just completely obsessed with how much revenue am I making, how much uh, hits I got, how many apps got downloaded. All internal metrics are all internal business metrics, right? That uh, They are just obsessed with it and that's their only viewpoint of how they think about what success means. Examples of this company, uh, this particular problem. We can't name it, but I feel like one of the clients we have... Uh, in fitness, it's kind of like that, right? Very, um, very internal metrics focused and not very external what is happening in the world and what do we do and all that stuff. But this is something that you will see most product teams as they evolve will get into this sort of loop, right? Which is what you, some of you are saying that it becomes very internal focused and they forget sight of what the original problem was. Uh, ivory tower, what does it mean? They know the customer really well. They're just sitting in their cabins and they have a viewpoint of what they think works. Right? So, lack of customer research. Um, anybody that we, any company that you think does this? Right? So, and that's basically one of the value adds that we bring as an organization. Science lab optimization at the cost of everything else. It should be the fastest API, it should be the fastest this, it should be, everything should be hyper-optimized and you're just optimizing, optimizing, optimizing and that's what is sucking up all your engineering effort. Examples of companies, you know? VI. Vodafone Idea is actually a good one. Uh, 
I think they completely missed the bus in terms of what the market was needing, but they kept trying to internally optimize. Uh, feature factory, very similar to hamster wheel, uh, but with the difference that they, even before the feature is out, they have the next feature, and the next feature, and the next feature, and the next feature, without thinking through what, uh, um, what happened with the first feature and how did it all sort of line up. Think of click, up ClickUp is, I feel like, going down that path right now, uh, which is that it's become a feature factory with so many features and continuous things. And they started off really well, but I don't think they, they're there. Business school, all use of science and data. Frameworks, put a framework here, put a framework there. Everything is just frameworks and nothing really makes sense. If you see pets.com, that long back, uh, when they started off, they started off with this, right? They said that this is the market potential of all, so many 300 million people in the US, at least 50% of them have pets. And even if 25% of them buy a pet, we have a great product, right? It's all at the business model and business uh, MBA level, but not really getting to the brass tacks of it. Uh, roller coaster, fast paced twists and turns. Now we are doing this, now we are doing that, now we are doing this also. What is this? We are talking about roller coaster. Fast. Twitter. Twitter is going through that right now, which is so pink confused as to what does it want to be, right? Uh, here, there, and everywhere. Um, Bridge to nowhere, okay, which is that I am, this is also a lot of companies are going through this, right? AI is here and now we just have to use AI for the sake of AI, right? Because future outcomes, we don't know what is there in the future, so now itself we have to build everything, right? I'm sure there are lots of companies that have started using AI for the sake of AI. Okay, negotiating table, trying to keep everyone happy. Who are the, who are the everyone here? No. Internal stakeholders. Internal stakeholders. They're like, oh, sales team wanted this. Okay, we'll build it. Customer service team wanted this. Okay, we'll build that also. Uh, uh, marketing team said, this is a good feature to have. We'll build that also. Right? If you build a product for everything, then you built a product for no one. Right? Uh, and, and this is true for life as well. Right? Like, many times you can't keep everybody happy. Uh, um, and you need to trade uh, in terms of what will work for the user at what point and then make the prioritization accordingly. Throne room. One guy with a whipsaw saying, I'm telling you, just do this. You know, this one person, not even ivory tower, and this is a little different with the ivory tower. Everybody feels that we understand. Uh, throne room is that one person saying that just, just miss. Just do it. Okay. <laughs> uh, but see, that's the interesting thing, right? Like when I read this also, I thought all of us have so many products to sort of relate to. Uh, but in my opinion, I think the root cause is the lack of vision, which is that they don't really know where they're going. Okay. They don't know what best means. They don't know what best airplane means. And because of that, uh, um, all of these problems sort of happen, right? Like you don't understand who a user is, what their needs are, when will we do what, and towards what overall ultimate goal are we doing all of this towards, right? I got that from Chad GPT. <laughs> I said, Chad GPT, give me a quote on lack of vision. <laughs> uh, um, okay. So I want to, and of course, there's no product thinking session without paying homage to Mr. Jobs. So uh, I had seen this video many, many years ago, and then I uh, thought it was a good one to sort of go back and listen to. We listen to the first three minutes, it's a 15 minute video. But I, I want you guys to pay attention to how he's articulating the vision. Scientific American, I think it was, did a study in the early 70s 
on the efficiency of locomotion. And that's what they did was for all different species of things on the planet, birds and cats and dogs and fish and man and goats and stuff, they measured how much energy does it take for a goat to get from here to there, right? Kilocalories per kilometer or something, I don't know what they measured it in. And they ranked them, they published a list, and, and the condor won. The condor took the least amount of energy to get from here to there. And man was, didn't do so well, came in with a rather unimpressive showing about a third of the way down the list. But fortunately, someone at Scientific American was insightful enough to test man with a bicycle. And man with a bicycle won, twice as good as the condor, all the way off the list. And what it showed was that man as a tool maker has the ability to make a tool to amplify an inherent ability that he has. And that's exactly what we're doing here. It's exactly what we're doing here. We're not making bicycles to be ridden between Palo Alto and San Francisco. Okay, we're making bicycles. And yes, certain bicycles have certain generic attributes, like in general, 10 speeds are better to ride in mountains than one speeds, and other things like that. But in general, what we're doing is we're building tools that amplify a human ability. Just like the, um, you could say that the Industrial Revolution was basically an amplification of a human ability, sweat, right? We amplified sweat, fractional horsepower motors, et cetera, et cetera. What we're working towards now is the ability to amplify another human ability. And we're just starting to get the glimmerings of things that that Apple is going to try to do over the next three or four years is to... It's interesting. I mean, he himself is short-sighted because he said three or four years. But I think... It's so powerful, right? Uh, what is Apple's vision? It's not about, hey, I'll make the fastest computers. It's not about uh, making cool gadgets, right? Um, to make a contribution to the world by making tools for the mind that advance humankind, right? Uh, and I think it's such a clear, powerful vision. And like that video was in 1970s, and I feel like this is still true, like 60 years later, as to what Apple really does. Of course, I just um, disclaimer: this vision has changed. Uh, it still says tools, but it says uh, make tools and leave the world better than we found it. Right? But how many of you guys saw the uh, Apple Vision Pro video. But why don't you tell us what the product is and what were your takeaways? Uh, so there were rumors that Apple was going to release augmented reality or a virtual reality glasses five years back. So there were, you know, there were a lot of uh, contemplating on what features are going to come in and all that. So we were all expecting, so we have seen a lot of VRs where you just attach a phone or they just screens and all that. So when Apple released this, the world was kind of shocked. So they took it to another level. So Vision Pro is basically just a see-through uh, VR, I mean AR set where you can see anything, you can do anything and everything in the reality of uh, the world and you get to kind of experience what you cannot experience with any sort of uh, virtual reality or augmented reality classes. So, the product itself is basically just a glass. Sorry. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Just a glass where you see. So, let's say I'm working on a computer. So, I'm just wearing my glasses, working on a computer. I look up, what happens is my computer screen comes up. And I can, like, I have multiple tabs. I can just do this and that with my hands because the glasses have cameras. And uh, you can just start working, like, just by moving your hands. So, that is one thing. And even for the keyboard, I can just type in the air and then just gets uh, typed out. And uh, another feature is kind of dangerous, kind of scary because uh, when you want to watch movies, so you are sitting all alone at home and you want to experience the whole thing. So what happens is when I put on this, I can see, like I can see you guys, but I, I can still see a movie uh, you know, playing there. And uh, there is a feature where I can like blank you guys out where I'll be sitting let's say on top of Mount Everest and watching movies about Mount Everest. So that is one feature. I'll be lost like in this world. I can just immerse myself into that. So, but yeah, that is the gist of what vision was. Let's look at a quick... Thank you, Bharat. Um, 
But I feel like really once you see it is when but I feel I'm really the point I'm going to make is that once you see it, right? You still see that all of their things that they've done it has been creating a tool that advances um, mankind and their ability to use the brain. Introducing Apple Vision Pro. The era of spatial computing is here. When you put on Apple Vision Pro, you see your world and everything in it. Your favorite apps live right in front of you, but now they're in your space. This is Vision OS. Apple's first ever spatial operating system. It's familiar, yet groundbreaking. You navigate with your eyes. Simply tap to select, flick to scroll, and use your voice to dictate. It's like magic. Apps have dimension, react to light, and cast shadows. Even though these spatial experiences are happening inside Vision Pro, it looks, sounds, and feels like they are physically there. Hey. Foundational to Apple Vision Pro is that you're not isolated from other people. When someone else is in the room, you can see them, and they can see you. It inspires you, right? It keeps you focused. It focus I mean, it's not very focused that it's all tools for that one humankind. But it inspires you, like you are walking into Apple in 1970 and this is your vision that we are going to be creating tools that is going to advance humankind and you are ready to get to work, right? Um, and the point I was trying to make is that the tools that they are making are still all true to this vision. So, thanks to Amrita, she drew this graph out for me. Um, but very quickly, coming back to our topic, right, which is how uh, product things up, product teams operate, right? And we people in the Stanford team have been really familiar with this topic, which is value creation versus value capture, right? Now, let's say you have built a product, right? And if you are going to only uh, think about you. The black line is the maximum customer value that you think your product has already built, right? And then the yellow is the missed revenue, right? And what you're going to be doing is, as a salesperson, be like, hey, this is the revenue we are getting. The purple line is the actual revenue. This is the revenue you should be getting. So fill the gap, right? And you're only playing within this yellow area. Right, because you're only thinking about value capture. But a, a a great vision statement allows you to create value. Right, you go from a Macintosh to a, a iPhone to an Apple Watch to first ever first ever spatial computing device because you understand that my vision is this, and I need to think about how can I continuously create value. Yeah. Where most teams uh, uh, sort of uh, end up in the product danger zone is that they build features, even when they're building features, okay, they're building features to only capture value, right? I'll have a better subscription plan, I will give EMIs and whatever, right? I'll do whatever I can, I'll think about retention, I'll think about adoption, all of that. But it's only within the gamut of this is the maximum value that I've created for my user and now I need to find ways to capture that value. Make sense? Right? Yeah. You, okay. you, you have a question or you just... Yeah. So, what we're going to do, this is another video that I, I thought uh, made a lot of sense. Again, we're going to look at the first... Um, Maybe five or seven minutes. It's about it's a talk this guy gave who was the head of YouTube uh, and talks a little bit about innovation and visioning at Google. 
and we'll look at the first 10 minutes and then we'll get into it. Uh, that's an innovation also. The thing about innovation though is that because it's so many things, it's hard to get your head around. And I think that causes a lot of confusion around this term, innovation. Now I've been fortunate in my career to focus on innovation in a variety of contexts. I've done it as an engineer, I've done it in the business sector, I've done it as a designer. I've been able to do it in a lot of different industries. I've worked for industrial companies, consumer goods companies, um, in the agency world at IDEO, and most recently in the tech industry at Google. And I've been able to work on a lot of cool things, everything from robotics to consumer products to music, working with professional sports leagues, um, and most recently at Google within YouTube on video. So I've learned a lot about innovation, and I think one of the basic things I've learned, which is probably obvious in the exercise we just did, is that uh, innovation is many things, not one thing. So there are lots of frameworks out there that try to describe the different types of innovation, and I've, I've seen many of them. And there are some good ones, but I was never able to find one that really dialed in what I was seeing at Google and seeing in my career. So I want to share with you the way I think about innovation. It's a pretty simple framework. It's three kinds of innovation. Versioning, visioning, and venturing. They all start with V and they all end in I and G, and they rhyme. Uh, but these are three kinds of innovation that I want to talk to you about. And I'll use some examples um, at Google. So versioning, what is versioning? Well, versioning actually is a lot of what we've talked about the last couple days here. It's the small improvements that we can make to a product. Things like micro-optimizations, usability improvements, aesthetic improvements, um, and making many, many, many small improvements over time, which can be really powerful. And here's an example of maybe the most extreme version uh, extreme example of versioning at YouTube are our thumbnail sizes. So these thumbnails that, uh, that you see on YouTube, they are, over time, we've really optimized what is the right size of thumbnail. We've dialed that in to get the right uh, level of engagement. Make the thumbnail too big or too small, and engagement is lowered. So that's an extreme example of, of many, many things that we've done over the years in this area of versioning. And if you look at YouTube, Five, six years ago, the product is dramatically different as a result of all these small improvements that we've made over time. So this is a very, very important part of innovation. And again, it's something that we spent a lot of time on in the last couple of days. Now, the second type is called visioning. And visioning is really about taking bigger leaps than we might take in versioning. So these are things like major new feature. Maybe it's a major redesign of a product, which sometimes you have to do because times change, the market changes, our user needs change. And so sometimes we have to do these major redesigns, or sometimes it's just a, a brand new product that we're going to build and launch. So an example of this is at YouTube is YouTube Music. So YouTube Music is a separate app, separate from our main app. It's a, an experience that is completely focused on the music um, consumption experience. It's listening first, so very different than YouTube, and it's a paid product. So this is, was a big deal. This took many years to work on and get right, and this is an example of a major leap that we made in YouTube to launch this new, to build and launch this completely new product. Now there's a third type of innovation called venturing, and the examples I'll give here are things like completely new ventures, advanced R&D, moonshot projects. Now, not many companies can afford to invest in here. Fortunately, at Google, we can invest in here, and so we do things like this. If you're familiar with Project Loon, so this is a... How many of you guys know about Project Loon? Loon. Space Tourism. Not Space Tourism. That's for a Wi-Fi. 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 Yeah, so they, they put up all these hot air balloons that they want to, and all of them have a version of it. Facebook has a solar plane. Tesla launched uh, Z. Origin has the same. Tesla launched its satellite network. But these are all moonshot projects, right? Uh, and these are venturing. You're going to something completely different. And that's what uh, some of our venturing teams are. Um, I think we spend a lot of time as an organization, right? Uh, especially the product strategy team in terms of versioning, right? We're making small, small, small improvements on 
<coughs> what can be done and it should it's very important as he gave the example of youtube as well that over time to drive adoption uh you are playing around with the thumbnail images and you want people to spend more time etc etc which is all fine and i think it's important and it's part of the job that we do but as far as this particular course is concerned right uh, uh we are going to be focusing a little bit more on the vision layout of it right and all that we have discussed so far has been towards that which is that how can we step back and have a larger viewpoint of what is our customers need and within that um what sort of product features are we building so that we are creating value not just capturing value yeah so the whole objective of this initiative is to be able to understand how to create value uh and set the overall sort of um a rhythm and a pace with which you want all decisions to be made in the future so uh the guide breaks it down into these metrics right which is vision principles mission strategic strategic place tactics metrics and outcome okay where do we play when we work with our clients right now where do we play the most strategy team how do we play so right now all of us including our clients all of us are focused on hey what is the strategy play therefore what feature should i build at what point and how am i going to measure this in terms of metrics right and then sort of goes back in loop saying that uh um did the strategy play work out then work out etc what's the difference between strategy and tactic chess players in the house Yeah. So strategy is basically a, an overall thing, saying like, okay, I'll start with a particular game. I don't know. You guys have so many names, right? I start with the bishop, and therefore, and then within that, you'll have minor games, right? That minor plays that you'll do to get the king, or so get the rook or the whatever. And those are tactical things that you'll do. A strategic strategy is a little bit more uh, high level. So. Uh, the reason i'm 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 kind of staying the whole session today a little bit more on vision principles and mission i'm showing all these videos etc because i want us to sort of really internalize the difference between a vision statement and strategy and not conflate versioning to visioning right and when you're creating the vision statement of your product it needs to be the x to 10x vision uh, and not really being the thing of okay i'm building an lms solution for a fifth grade math student right that's basically a very narrow view point of what you're trying to do uh, and you're missing the bus in terms of it could be an lms it could be a tap it could be uh, an ai device whatever right so I, we'll go back and look at vision how it is and then we'll, we'll sort of end it with homework today we're going to talk about purpose and within purpose so this guy this guy has uh, a framework called percolation which is uh, purpose clarity and execution right but again for the purposes of our discussion i want us to talk a little bit more about the purpose really there are two things that matter defining that purpose right it's defining a vision and defining a strategy or the road map right uh so this is going to be our focus today all right so with that let's start with vision and before we actually get into the vision actually let me actually break it down for you in 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 the sense like how when you think about you know just generally how you build products and 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 kind of the methodologies you should be following it's typically a good uh, sort of a, a process or a good sort of philosophy there is to take a look at it in a top down fashion uh starting with a vision defining a vision taking your time to build it defining the north star principles we don't talk a lot about principles and i'm going to jump into that today which are your core values what what matters to you when you think about building products right 
then getting into the uh, the mission, the strategic plays, kind of like your roadmap, you know, the high level strategic plays. You're going to have to have, maybe it's a few years down the line, or maybe it's next year's roadmap or strategic plays, and then breaking them down into actual tactical stuff. These are key activities you're going to pursue as a roadmap. And eventually executing and delivering on those, the outcomes and the metrics you're going to follow, which circle around typically your customer metrics, business metrics, technology metrics, perhaps your partner metrics. Um, and, and, and these things, even though it's a top-down approach and it's a living thing, you know, it, it never stops, um, it, it is still open to you changes, right? It, it's going to change over time. You might change your vision moving forward some point in time. But by and large, you're going to change your strategy a lot based on the outcomes you're producing, right? So think about the, when you think about building products, you're getting into a new job and you own owning a product uh, or uh, you got promoted and you got more increased ownership of a product portfolio, always think about setting a good proper vision and then everything else will follow. Take that top-down approach. Uh, you will appreciate yourself doing it. Your customers will appreciate it because you're producing great outcomes and your organization, the executives will appreciate it because you're bringing clarity to that. So top-down approach, big fan of that. So with that, now let's jump into the vision. All right. So vision, you all know that's your destination. That's your end goal, right? What you want to achieve maybe three years, five years down the line, right? Um, and when you think about vision, kind of the core components of a vision, what it should be, is it should be aspirational. You should never settle with mediocrity. Think about what you want to be great at in five years from now, what your product should be great at. It should be achievable. Don't make something like, oh, I want to just like build a product, a B2B product that has a social component to it. That doesn't just typically marry well, right? So don't be outrageous, be achievable. Keep it long-term. Vision should be long-term. You know, typically it should be around three years, five years down the line. It should be very customer focused. Um, you know, you should have the elements of who are you building it for? And it should be business aligned. All the key sort of strategic initiatives and your vision should reflect in there. What are the outcomes you're going to produce? So critical that these kind of pillars and the elements um, be there as part of your vision definition. I also want to caveat that your product vision should never, ever directly, directly, that's an important word here, be your company vision. Your company vision can be miles different, can be close to the product vision, but it's a, it's a thing on its own. It applies to products, it applies to finance, operations in the company, and so many other different places. Uh, and you cannot just align directly with your company vision. Your product vision is your own vision. It can align in the sense, you know, historically, like, like, like I mean, think about a company vision, okay, we want to go after a certain segment of customer, a small to medium business, or we want to go after enterprise. Then your product vision would be, I want to build X, Y, and Z for that particular enterprise customer. Okay, so you kind of can't align, but, but don't directly borrow from the company vision. It just doesn't work well. That's a totally different beast. Um, a great example, since I come from Amazon, I've studied uh, some of the... Um, uh, you know, the visions and the strategies over there, uh, different organizations, how they built it, uh, it's AWS. We all know who AWS is. The reason why AWS has become successful is because they have had a stellar vision. And the vision still exists that they built about 15 years ago. The vision is to build a reliable, scalable, low-cost infrastructure platform. So if you see reliable, scalable, and low-cost, those are the strategic pillars, and it's reflected in the vision. Right, so that's still aspirational in the world, right? So they want to build it for all the people in the world. So it's aspirational, it's achievable. They've achieved the reliability, scalability, and low cost. Uh, and they also are talking about the customer in here as well. We want to build it for thousands of businesses. These are businesses in 190 countries. So who are who are they building for? Uh, they showcase that in the vision, and their vision has not changed. By the way, in the last 15 years or so, it kind of has stayed the same. So you can see most of the... Do you guys get an idea? A vision statement, aspirational, achievable, long-term, customer focused business line. Right? Okay. I feel like I have not... So here was like... Uh, yeah. Product uh, vision, not equal... I mean, not uh, company vision, right? Yeah. So then they are aligning with the business. So how that is... You are aligning with the customer needs. Now, for example, uh, you could be Airbnb. And your vision could be that find 
a stranger safe place to stay, right? In any country that they go to. Your product vision could be uh, very broad saying give tools to uh, um, uh, renters as well as users to f feel that they are safe and make it a hassle-free experience. So that's your product vision, which still uh, um, goes in line with the company's vision. It's not necessary that it would be the same, but uh, it could be the same, but that the product can have its own separate vision, especially in uh, services that have an operational layer, right? Like Uber could have a mission of moving, they have a vision of movi moving atoms or something like that they said. But the tools that they give uh, to us and to their drivers could be different. And then their vision statement can also apply to how they treat the drivers. Uh, how they treat us and how they work with the local communities and all that stuff, not necessarily to the product by itself. Make sense? Yes. Anybody else have any question? Okay, so now we're going to break into teams and we'll get into a case study. So, how do we distribute the case studies? Okay, I'm going to randomly give it, I don't know which one's where. Yeah. This is like choosing question by question by question. Okay. Take five minutes. <laughs> okay, quickly read your case studies. Why don't you read it out loud? Okay, team one will read their case studies loudly. Yeah, go, go for it. Everything or just the headline? Fully. Read the first paragraph. So each of each of us can read the title and the first paragraph. Okay, this is the title, okay? Find a style oasis for urban working class. And this is the content which I'm going to read now. In the heart of Mumbai where dreams chased with rea reality, the urban working class gave it their all. Their lives were a constant juggle between family, work and the chaotic streets of the metropolis. Amidst their daily struggles, one challenge loomed large, finding the time and guidance to navigate the world of fashion. So the problem is finding the time and guidance to navigate the world of fashion. Okay? Basically, how how to decide what to wear. Yeah. Yeah. That was the full thing too. Navigating challenges, empowering young women for solo travel in India. Okay, read the, but that's the, that's the context, right? How can you, team two is how can you help with young women travel and then there are uh, specific problems. Team three, go for it. Seeking care in a busy world, the struggles of young pet parents. <laughs> In the heart of a bustling city, a community of young pet parents flourished. There were individuals with a deep love for their furry companions, seeking the best care and attention for their beloved pets. However, they found themselves confronted with a pressing problem. As these young pet parents embarked on their journey to find reliable pets and grooming services, they were met with frustration and uncertainty. The vast array of options bewildered them, making it difficult to discern which establishments could provide the quality care the pets deserve. Recommendations from friends and family only scratched the surface, giving them yearning for a more comprehensive service. Done. Awesome. Two, four. <laughs> <laughs> Dating struggles of heroes. <laughs> 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 Yeah, divorce in India faces significant challenges when adapting to navigate the, navigating the dating scene. 
and find a comfortable partner, leaving them feeling isolated and discouraged. Done. Team 5. Journey through Chennai's communal conundrum. In Chennai, where the heat dance and the pavements and the aroma of filter coffee filled the air, a group of office goers faced daily struggle during their commute. These hardworking individuals found themselves caught in a dilemma when it came to finding a safe and affordable mode of transportation to their workplace. Awesome. Everybody, round of applause to Amrita for coming here to school case study. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what we are going to do over the next two weeks is what I am expecting is that you guys create a stellar vision for the problem that you have at hand. Yes? yes. What are the attributes of a vision statement? Ambitious? Aspirational. Aspirational, achievable, customer focused. Business. Aligned with business goals. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> So, um, now let me just give me five, ten more minutes. Hi, we are. So, um, ten more minutes and we'll wrap up. What we're going to do now, very quickly, we are going to look at the process of creating the customer vision. First, who comes first always? User. Right? User. Perfect. Good job. Finally, over three years of saying it. We have reached. Uh, each of your teams are going to go and conduct user interviews and speak to these users and understand what their problems are. Mind voice. Oh, this is your contribution. All right. So you're going to be conducting user interviews and understanding the needs and problems. Uh, we, have, we have done our best to sort of articulate the problems and the user and the segment and those things in your case study. So in interviews, right, now we are going to quickly look at how to create customer vision pyramids, okay, and how are you going to sort of stack it up. It will take another 10 minutes, we'll look at that. Next week when we meet, we are going to create the customer vision pyramid and come, so we are going to do the interviews and come back with the customer vision pyramid and you are going to present to the team saying this is, these are the people I interviewed, this is what I understood and this is how I have st stacked their needs. Yes? And then along with the customer vision pyramid, they are also going to create a business vision pyramid. Right? Because we understand that you can't be not running a social service. Even if you are running a social service, it needs to be sustainable. So the, with the customer vision, how does that sort of stack with the business vision and business KPIs and goals, right? Each team is going to present it next week. Once we are done with that, we are going to next week go to see and learn something called vision storyboarding, right? And what are the steps that a customer or user take and how will you create a vision board and storyboard for your vision? That's going to be week two. And week three is going to be arriving at the actual vision statement, right? The same team that the guys are in, the same case study, we will then go to use in week four for positioning, okay? Which is how are you going to create an amazing positioning? Because a lot of you said GTM is a problem, all of that. Positioning and a go to market strategy. Now that you have a cool vision and a problem that you want to solve for. How are you going to build demand? And finally, the last three weeks, we are going to look at systems thinking in terms of each of these problems that we have, what are the different moving parts, right? And how do they uh, interact with each other, right? And I think it's important for you guys to understand that as you try to build products and solutions for our clients. So that's the scope for the next 12 weeks. Okay. Uh, can you look at, very quickly, look at customer pyramids? Hey there, I'm Rajesh, co-author of Build What Matters, back for another weekly chapter update. This is chapter three, where we introduce the concept of, of key outcomes and outcome KPI pyramids. Um, again, the, the core theory here is 
if you think back to chapter one, that top 10 dysfunction of the counting house and an obsession with those internal metrics, which is really talking about, you know, revenue, NPS, daily active users, those types of things, which are, are great measures of, of, of product health, but no individual customer cares about. Uh, in this chapter, we introduce the idea of key outcomes and using these outcome pyramids to identify what does my customer and, or user really care about? What are they trying to accomplish in their lives? Why is our product relevant to them? And so, you know, I wanted to cover a little bit of the theory behind outcome uh, KPI pyramids, uh, use this visual to, to kind of do so. Uh, at the top of the pyramid sits the key outcome. This is the thing that this persona, customer, you know, user, maybe your CEO, is finds most important and the, the, their metric of progress. In the middle layer, there's a set of leading indicators that then you could break that key outcome out, almost like a math equation, and start thinking about what are the constituent parts that lead to that outcome. And then finally, at this bottom layer, these are the customer behavior or product KPIs that are fast moving. They can change release over release. They probably measure things like usage or you know email opens or those types of things. Um, and we like the pyramid visualization for two main reasons. Number one is that it forces you to create uh, or the, understand the relationship between KPIs. I can't tell you how many SaaS KPI product dashboards I've seen where it's just like literally 25 or 35 metrics or charts that look like they're all moving in different directions. And, and when we start talking to teams about what they do with those things, they they admit themselves that it's a little bit overwhelming and it, sometimes it's hard to focus on what matters most. And so um, the pyramid structure really forces teams to identify what what is the actual outcome we're trying to drive and what are these leading indicators at the bottom that can help us identify whether we're, we're making early progress towards those, um, especially because some of the key outcomes is you know revenue in a B2B uh, business for example, are lagging indicators and they take a long time to move. And so you want to know what are some of those leading indicators that might help us understand whether we're, we're on track uh, to hit some goals, especially. The other reason we like uh, uh, the pyramids is that it really limits the number of KPIs that teams are, are tracking. Um, it, w I haven't done any hard research or data. I don't have any hard data to back this up. But, you know, if I was going to estimate how much time it takes each month to report on, to sort of like compile, calculate, report, double check, answer questions related to every metric that you're tracking, I would guess it's probably 20 hours a month. And so if you're tracking 5, 10, 15 metrics, now you have a full-time data person whose job is to solely, you know, sole job is to, to, to measure um, progress. And that's good and it's important. You need to do it. But, um, you know, for most organizations, they don't have the luxury of having a dedicated person who's going to be doing that. So it often falls on the product person. And I think it's important to make sure that they have the ability to measure just a handful of metrics that are really important, predictive, um, and that, that help the team understand whether the product is delivering the value it was intended to. So uh, that was the, the core concept behind, you know, outcome KPIs. Uh, I did want to share a story, which I think I talked about in the book, but uh, you know, the way I learned the lesson around these outcome metrics came from Hello Wallet. We made financial wellness web and mobile apps that we sold to employers, uh, and that was offered as an employee benefit to help their employees reach their financial goals. And when I joined, we had just made this transition into this kind of employee benefit uh, business model. And it wasn't until I started joining a lot of sales calls and asking towards the end of the call, like one question that really illuminated to me that, that, that our buyer was looking for multiple different things. And that one question was, if you piloted Hello Wallet for a year, what would what metric would you be looking at at the end of that time period to decide whether you were going to roll Hello Wallet out to all of your employees as a financial wellness benefit? And I heard drastically different answers from, you know, I want better retirement readiness using the 401k to I need people to adopt my high deductible health plan to I want people to have emergency savings and I need people to be able to pay down debt so they're not stressed about work and, and all these different outcomes. And um, guess what? It's hard for a startup product team, especially to, to be able to deliver on multiple outcomes simultaneously. So it's really important to make sure everyone's aligned on what is at, who are we building this product for and what are they hoping that it'll help them accomplish and, and why is that important in their lives. So uh, again, really quick overview. Confused, Chopin? Okay. Um, basically, when you're going to do interviews, right, what we want to arrive at are key outcomes and we'll look at the pyramid in just a second right but when you look at it 
when you un, when you talk to your users, first you'll understand what are the custom behaviors, which are leading indicators to what outcomes they they want to do. Right? For example, uh, I want to lose weight. What is the leading indicator? People are saying that I'm. Huh? Losing weight is. No, losing weight is my thing. Outcome. What are my leading indicators? Sorry. How many times did I work out, right? And then what are my customer behaviors? Do you, yeah, I mean that's leading indicator that are you regular, etc. But like customer behavior would be, um, no, I would say, did you pack your gym bag, or did you? Get up in the morning on time. Right? How often do you get up on time? Which means so you're getting to the gym, which means so you're losing weight. Right? Behaviors to indicators to outcomes. Right? So when you are going to uh, look at the this is how you're going to create your KPI three template. Right? Which is what is the key outcome that you want to drive? Uh, I want to lose weight. I People compliment me is my level 1 KPI. My clothes fit me is my level 2 KPI. People compliment me could be different things. Uh, level 2 KPI would be uh, I have a toned body, right? Uh, level 2 KPI would, same level 2 KPI could be uh, people, why would people compliment me? I have 6 fat abs, right? Things like that. So from there you will get into behave. So this final level is basically actual action that I'll take, which will lead me to um, influence each of the levels above. Right? We'll just look at an example. So this is a story that they talk about in the book, which is Chuck Wagon's vision is to help users prepare and serve home cooked meals. Right? That's their vision. Uh, and it's a B2C business and the primary amount, the primary problem is the amount of time it takes to get a home cooked meal on the table. Right? So it's the same problem of Swiggy but on the completely different thing which is, in this case it is home cooked meals. Right? So when you look at it, the primary thing is that they want to reduce the time spent on meals. Right? What do, how can you, I reduce time spent on meals? By reducing planning time and I can reduce the cooking time. Right? How can I reduce the planning time? And the time spent fi finalizing the meal plan or time spent grocery shopping. Right? Uh, how can I reduce cooking time? The actual time spent cooking, the time spent cleaning up. Right? How can I reduce time spent finalizing meal plan? Meal plan creation time, meal plan editing time. Right? That will help me reduce the meal plan finalizing. How can I reduce time uh, on grocery shopping? The time it takes for me to go to the grocery store and come back and the amount of time I actually take to shop over there. Right? All of these are things that will help me eventually reduce time spent on meals. Correct? We agree? Likewise on that side, right? Prep time versus cook time. Cooking area time versus dishes time. Clear. How much time I spend to clean up the cooking area versus how much time do I spend to clean up the dishes? Yes? Clear? Yes. Convinced? Confused? Convinced. Okay. So this is from the customer needs perspective, right? Likewise, we'll create a pyramid template from the business perspective, right? So the business is going to be like, okay, I'm going to give him the paid subscription of uh, Helping you create your meal plan, or I will do grocery delivery, right? And at the end of the day, I want annual recurring revenue. How much money am I making as a business? This is my key metric that I'm tracking. But the second level KPI is how many paid app subscriptions do I have and how many grocery deliveries that I'm doing. Uh, paid users for grocery delivery, maybe it's a subscription plan or grocery orders, specific grocery orders. How many app downloads to how many free to paid conversions? How much traffic am I getting? How many are downloading? How many are in trial? How many upgrade? How many grocery lists are created on that side? And how many offer? Uh, when when I give an offer, how many are accepting it? And this is from the business side of things. Yes. 
Okay. Did each of you have your case studies? Please go ahead and interview people and figure out how to create your customer pyramid template. You will do that in behavior needs, which lead to lagging indicators, sorry, leading indicators, which lead to key outcomes, right? And then you'll create a pyramid. One of the things that he was talking about is that you don't want to create too big a pyramid. It's so many different things. So there's an exercise of prioritization there as well. Uh, and from here, we'll get into vision board. From vision board, we'll write the vision statement. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it for all the energy and effort. Next week, we will uh, start off directly with each of you guys doing presentations of uh, what needs you understood. What, how many people you this did uh, interviews with, bonus points for things you know, I'll give bonus points for, and then uh, uh, showing the customer pyramids template. Done? Yes. All right, thank you. Bye. Uh, thank you.